Is building a gaming PC with a 4-core CPU worth it in 2020? Well, after over 130 consecutive benchmark runs, I think I have the answer. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and today I'll be exploring the topic of many subreddit debates. Is four cores enough for gaming in 2020 and beyond? Now, while I can't predict the future, I can test in the present. But before I get into all the testing, let me explain the intended audience for this video. This is for the person who really wants to build a capable PC just for gaming, but is on a tight budget and needs to stretch every dollar. Someone who's looking to spend between $100 and $130 on a CPU and just wants it to perform out of the box without needing to mess with things like core multiplier and voltages in the BIOS because while the core audience of most tech-related YouTube channels are perfectly familiar and comfortable with overclocking a CPU, most average PC users aren't. For those reasons, today I'll be comparing the $120 4 core 8 thread Ryzen 3 3300X and the 6 core 12 thread Ryzen 5 1600 AF. The MSRP has settled at around $100 to $120 on this when it's available. I had intended to have an 8 core Ryzen 7 1700 for the comparison too, but the one I ordered arrived with a dead memory channel. But the point should be made with just the two CPUs and the point is more of a demonstration of core speed versus core count. What's more important for PC gaming in 2020, having more cores or having faster cores? With that, I'll make a concession right up front. Having more faster cores is best to a limit and of course budget allowing. I'll talk more about that after I present the data, but first the test bench, and today I have an almost big boy test bench to work with. It consists of a MSI B450 Tomahawk motherboard, a 2 by 8 gigabyte kit of G-Scale Trident Z Neo DDR4 3600 MHz CL16 memory, a Sabrent 256 gigabyte M.2 NVMe boot drive with a 4 gigabyte Samsung SATA SSD that holds the game library a Cooler Master 240mm AIO, and an EVGA RTX 2080 Ti Black Edition. The BIOS will be set to default on our motherboard, and the only change will be setting the XMP profile on the memory. Now, the memory will run at 3600MHz CL16 with the 3300X, but will be set to 3200MHz CL16 on the 1600AF and that's just the limitations of the silicon. Also, to demonstrate how these CPUs will scale on a more balanced and realistic system, I'll also be running all the benchmarks for both CPUs with an AMD Radeon RX 5700 replacing the RTX 2080 Ti with a full graphics driver wipe and reinstall between GPUs. Additionally, I'm using a clean Windows install and have disabled all background apps and notifications. As for the benchmarks, I'll be testing a total of 10 games, most of which will lean CPU dependent and a few which are more balanced between CPU and GPU utilization. And I'll be testing all the games at 1080p, high preset or the graphics preset that's one click under whatever the highest preset is for each game. This is both because 1080p is the resolution people building lower budget PC game at and it's where there'll be enough load on the CPU to where we should be able to see the difference between these two CPUs pretty easily. So that's the intro, let's get into the benchmarks. Starting with the 3300X paired with the RTX 2080 Ti, we see at 1080p high settings we were able to maintain consistently high average frame rates across all titles, and although we did experience 1% lows dip as far as 50% for our most demanding CPU titles of Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Assassin's Creed, we averaged a 37% drop in 1% lows across all titles. Now, if we bring in the results of the 1600 AF with the 2080 Ti, we see it was also able to maintain consistently high frame rates across all titles, however, did fall behind the 3300X in every title by margins of up to 24% in the heavy simulations of Forza Horizon 6 to just 2% lower in the more balanced Ghost Recon Breakpoint. 
the additional threads of the 1600 were able to close the gap in 1% lows in Tomb Raider and Assassin's Creed, however, fell behind a little more steeply in titles like Battlefield 5 and Overwatch, resulting in an almost identical average 1% low frame rate dip to the 3300X of 36%. As a note, the MSI Afterburner overlay and benchmarking functions are not compatible with Forza, therefore 1% lows could not be obtained. Also, I want you to make a mental note of the Ryzen 5 1600 average frame rate of 118 and 112 respectively for Tomb Raider and Battlefield 5. Now, scaling down to a more balanced system, we see the results of the 3300X paired with the RX 5700. The 4-core CPU was still able to maintain adequate, even high frame rates paired with the mid-range GPU, even maintaining over 60 FPS for the very demanding Assassin's Creed Odyssey. However, here we did see some of the worst 1% lows, most notably in Ghost Recon and Borderlands 3, which was the only title where there were a few stutters and frame drops apparent. Borderlands 3 is one of the most inconsistent titles when benchmarking for 1% lows. This may be due to the fact that it's built on the highly CPU dependent Unreal 4 game engine, but employs stylized full texture maps in lieu of more traditional tile based textures, which puts much more of stress on the GPU and can cause instability, especially at higher quality settings. In any case, this resulted in an average 1% low dip of 42% across all titles. Now, remember those previous scores of 118 and 112 for Tomb Raider and Battlefield? Notice here that the 3300X with a $350 RX 570 beat the $1100 RTX 2080 Ti each averaging 123 FPS. This is due to the 1600 causing a 100% bottleneck in these titles with the 2080 Ti. I'll show you the details on this as soon as we finish the charts. And the final group of benchmarks to bring in is the 1600 AF with the RX 5700. Here we see that for the first time, a title not able to maintain at least 60 FPS, albeit a very demanding one in Assassin's Creed, and again, the average FPS of every title dipped below the 3300X, however, not by as in a significant margin as with the 2080 Ti, because we're much more GPU bound with the RX 5700. Again, while the 1600 AF was slower, it did produce some notably smoother gameplay in some runs of Borderlands and Ghost Recon, however, was statistically the same in all others. And again, we see the average FPS of Tomb Raider and Battlefield is basically or exactly the same as with the 2080 Ti. Let's look at the averages real quick, and we see at best possible performance, the 3300X outperforms the 1600 AF by just over 11% in both average and 1% low FPS. The margin was cut to just over 7% average FPS and just a few 1% low frames when tested with a more balanced GPU. Now let's look at its CPU bottleneck, and to do that I'll be analyzing the Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark results because they don't just include FPS numbers, but separate GPU and CPU frame time results. Looking at the Ryzen 5 1600 AF and RTX 2080 Ti results, the first thing to notice is the system was 0% GPU bound during the benchmark, meaning there was a 100% CPU bottleneck. In the graph to the left, we see actual frame times for both the CPU and GPU. Notice the green CPU line is above the orange GPU line, meaning it's taking up to 6 milliseconds longer for the CPU to process an individual frame, while the GPU just has to sit there and wait on the info from the CPU during the entire benchmark run. Think of it as a really mismatched relay team. Now, when we look at the results from the 3300X, we see a more acceptable 53% GPU bound run. Now, while PC gaming enthusiasts are looking for that number to be 100% GPU bound, meaning their CPU is effortlessly handing off the info to the GPU, coming from the SI world, I can tell you OEM and system integrators are shooting for that 50-50 balance. Anything more or less for target frame rate means they spent too much on either the GPU or CPU reducing their potential profit margin. This is how gaming PC builders define bottlenecks, so 
technically we're looking at a 3% GPU bottleneck here, but realistically we still see frame time discrepancies approaching 4 milliseconds, however it does demonstrate that the faster single core speed still trumps the slower CPU even if the slower has more cores and threads. Well. I think the data was pretty clear. The 4-core Ryzen 3300X is a perfectly capable CPU for gaming in 2020, even outperforming a 6-core 12-thread CPU. For those of you who are satisfied with the conclusion the benchmarks made, well, there you go. Anyone who wants to take a deeper dive into why this all is why it is, let's do this. First. Let's briefly talk about what it is the CPU does when it comes to gaming. Basically, the CPU performs all the calculation that tells where everything is, what it's doing, and how everything is interacting with everything else. So for, say, a game like Tomb Raider, for each frame the CPU is telling the GPU where all the scenery is, where Laura is in that scene, how she's interacting with the scene, and how the scene, like the NPCs, are reacting to her. You can think of it kind of like the CPU is drawing the outline or the wireframe of each of the frames, and the GPU then colors it in with the appropriate textures and lighting. For simulations like Forza, the CPU has to calculate multiple things like how the car reacts based on speed, how the other NPC cars react, how things like crashes are executed based on velocity and angle. It's doing a lot of physics. The faster those calculations can be done, the more frames can be rendered every second. Now, how does the CPU actually perform those calculations? You've undoubtedly heard the terms IPC and core clock or frequency. IPC or instructions per cycle is how many instructions a CPU core can fetch, decompile, execute, and compile per clock cycle. Clock speed or frequency is how many clock cycles there are in every second. This is typically measured in gigahertz, meaning in the case of the 1600 AF, which had a max sustained frequency of 3.7 gigahertz, it had a clock speed of 3.7 billion cycles per second. To figure out how much work a CPU core can do, you multiply the IPC by the frequency. So let's say the IPC for gaming instructions of the 1600 AF is two. Of course, IPC differs depending on the type of instructions being processed, but just for this scenario, we'll go with two. So at 3.7 GHz, the 1600 AF can process 7.4 billion instructions per second. Now, if I overclock it to 4.2 GHz, it's now processing 8.4 billion per second. Not bad, a billion more instructions every second. So now the scuttlebutt is that the third gen Ryzen has a 13 to 17% IPC improvement over second gen Ryzen, depending on what benchmark you use. For our scenario, let's shoot for the middle and say this 3300X has a 15% IPC uplift over the 1600. So that puts its IPC at 2.3 in our hypothetical. So at the same frequency of 3.7 gigahertz, the 3300X is processing 8.51 billion instructions per second. So at the base clock, 3300X is already performing more work than the overclock 1600. And at the 3300's max sustained boost clock of 4.35 gigahertz, we're looking at over 10 billion instructions per second. You can see why now even a CPU with higher clock speed can be slower than a CPU with higher IPC. Remember the AMD Piledriver FX CPUs? Now, of course, this is per core, so technically multiply by the number of cores and the 1600 should come out on top by about 4 billion instructions per second. So why is it still slower? This goes into how a multi-core CPU uses its cores to process instructions. Basically, there's a set of instructions built into the CPU that tells the CPU how to parse or divide up the instructions, which core thread or ALU to send each piece to, and how to put it all back together after it's been processed. 
this takes time for the CPU and depending on how efficiently it's able to do that affects its multi-core or multi-threaded performance. This is why the score of an all-core Cinebench CPU benchmark isn't the product of the single-core score multiplied by the number of threads or cores. Now, the CPU has a set of instructions on how to do that, but the software being processed by the CPU also needs to be written in a way to take advantage of that multi-core processing. PC games are built on a core game engine, and most modern game engines are written in a way to take advantage of the fewest numbers of cores, meaning if your CPU has a fast enough single core speed, the game will mostly rely on a single core. But as single core speed performance gets slower, the game will leverage more cores to process the instructions. And as the instructions are parsed across more cores, that tiny bit of lag appears. That's why today in 2020, superior single core performance still results in highest frame rates. Now, as far as the future, games today are starting to leverage multiple cores. It's typically for subroutines and the main work is still being done by a single core, which many people refer to as the world core, because again, it's doing most of the basic calculations needed for every game, where everything is, what it's doing, and how it's interacting with everything else. So as long as four core CPUs keep improving the amount of work they can do right in line with their multi-core counterparts, I think there'll be good low-cost options for good gaming experience for many more years. Reason two why I think this is true is because Game code doesn't keep up step for step with hardware improvements. If you look at even the newest games, the recommended hardware requirements are still several generations old. I looked up a few of new or upcoming games and most of the CPU requirements consisted of older four core Intel CPUs and up to a Ryzen 1600 on the AMD side and not this 1600 AF, the original 1600 and we already know this four core outperforms that. Now, there are a couple reasons for this. First, it can take years to develop a game. By the time the game is released, two or three generations of CPUs may have been released. And second is market share. My data is a bit old, but last year I saw a report that estimated about 80% of gaming PCs owned and sold had four core CPUs. Now, with the success of Ryzen, that number is probably lower, but it makes sense, considering until 2017, 2018, Intel only pumped out four core mainstream CPUs generation after generation. Also consider, unlike the DIY rigs me and most YouTube tech channel viewers build, the majority of gaming PCs sold are pre-builds. And up until very, very recently, almost every OEM and SI company out there had a multi-year exclusive contract with Intel for their CPUs four core CPUs. Because of all that, a mainstream game developer isn't going to just all of a sudden develop a game with an eight core 16 thread CPU minimum requirement because they would eliminate a huge percentage of their customer base. And finally, in the end, it just comes down to cash on hand. If you have 50 bucks left in the budget and you're debating between stepping up from say this 3300X to the 3600 or stepping up to the next level of graphics card, my advice is always go with the better graphics card. I mean, unless you only play heavy simulation games. So final conclusion, four cores is still good enough in 2020 as long as it's four fast cores. I probably wouldn't go with a first gen four core Ryzen at this point for AAA titles, but you'll be good to go with the 3300X, you know, when it's actually available. I would even be okay with recommending the Intel i3-10300 if the price didn't suck so bad. Anyway, that's it for this one. If you're still here, thanks for sticking around for my not too deep dive. I'm sure I probably didn't get technical enough for some of y'all, but my goal was not to get too technical for the target audience. I hope most of you learned something as that's always my goal. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join me next week when I get a little less technical and a little more destructive. Until then, stay safe.